Hey everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Francesca and I'm going to be your MC today for our uh, virtual event, System Thinking for Authorization. And today we're going to have uh, a few people speaking. We're going to start with Graham Naray, CEO and co founder of OSO. He's going to be talking about uh, our main topic for today um, what you can learn from the systems thinking perspective to help you build authorization systems and reason about them. We'll then have uh, Sam Scott, CTO and co-founder of OSO, give a demo um, of some new things that we've launched in OSO. Following that, we'll have a fun polar quiz and policy quiz uh, that our head of product, Jed Gresham, is going to run through. And then to close us out, we'll have an internal demo from Jesse Lax. Uh, but to kick things off, we put some questions uh, in the polls for today to just get to know you all a little bit more. And what we what we learned is that um, most of you, with the exception of one person, have built an authorization system or worked closely with engineers who have. So you're familiar with the problem of authorization and what it takes to get a system off the ground. So that's that's great. But for those who haven't, this is a, a great introduction as well. Um, and most folks in this uh, group are uh, running microservices architecture and not monoliths. So that is that is probably helpful for our presenters to know. Um, uh, so today we're gonna be alongside everything else, we're gonna be running a quiz. Uh, and for those who participate in the quiz, one lucky person, not the winner, but one lucky person is going to uh, go home with uh, an Oso oh sweatshirt. Uh, so please participate uh, and then we will pick a winner towards the end. Uh, but without further ado, I would love to uh, welcome Graham Naray to the stage. Graham, do you wanna take the... Hey everyone. So um, I was thinking uh, about this presentation and, and thinking back to a conversation that I had a few years ago. So I remember I was meeting with um, an endpoint security company um, and they said this thing to me that I'll never forget. They said, our authorization system is complex. But like the way they said it, it was like, no, our authorization system is complex, like more complex than normal. Oh, we had six engineers. They spent 18 months, you know, working on this thing, many layers, many roles, blah, blah, and they're telling me all about it. Okay, sure. And then not long after that, I was meeting with this HR SaaS company and they said something really similar. They said, well, our RBAC system is, is complex. Like, again, like, like they were sort of laying out that, well, you may not have seen this before, but you know, ours is especially complex for these reasons. And then not long after that, I had a conversation with this fintech company and they said something like almost exactly the same. So I started thinking like, okay, what's going on here? Um, is it the case that, you know, they're all dealing with this complexity, but, or, 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 or that, um, you know, is there something else at play here? And I think the answer is a, a little bit of both. You know, when you go to the doctor, uh, and something's bothering you, you can have a structured conversation with the doctor about, about that. You, know, you can say, well, you know, the doctor will say, what's bothering you? You'll say, oh, it's my knee. My knee's hurting me. And then they'll have some follow-up questions. Oh, okay. So, you know, is it a shooting pain? Is it a stabbing pain? Is it, is it a dull pain? And, and you can have this kind of back and forth where you're trying to solve the problem because we treat the body as a system. The body is a system. We have names for different parts of the body. We have uh, structured ways of talking about the way those different parts interact. And then obviously based on that, we can, we can do things to treat the body. And of course we, um, in, in programming, you know, we apply this um, concept all over the place. You know, can you imagine if someone were asking you about the, the way that data works in your application and your response was just like, well, my data is complex. We've got, We've got these things. Some of them have connections. Sometimes they have connections to each other. Sometimes we lay them out in this like linear kind of way where it's ordered. Um, no, obviously, that, you know, that's not how we do it. We have a way to classify different types of data structures. We could talk about trees and graphs and queues and lists. And, you know, we can and we have, you know, nouns and verbs that we use for talking about all those different data structures. Um, 
Uh, MVC is another great example of this. You know, Rails introduced this framework for um, thinking about the different pieces of an app of application uh, of an application, which is super useful for for web developers to think about the different pieces. Um, but authorization authorization is not treated like a system. Um, mo for most companies that we speak to, and at this point, I've met with well over a thousand engineering teams. Authorization is ad hoc code. It's sprinkled throughout your code base. Uh, it's implicit. Often it's it's convoluted. It's buried. Um, it's um, it's you know custom, as it were, to you know to the company specifically. And and it's a little bit crazy when you think about it, is because this is the core code that determines who should be allowed to see what in your application. Um, naming naming is a is an extremely powerful thing in software engineering. Um, being able to recognize a problem and give it a name is super powerful because once you have that, you can then come up with solutions and repeat those solutions in multiple places. Uh, but to do that uh, in authorization, we need to start treating it like a system. Um, and once you start to treat authorization like a system, the patterns emerge. Uh, and when the patterns emerge, we can come up with these repeatable solutions. So um, at OSO, we're flipping the model on its head. We believe that instead of authorization being something that's you know, implicit and convoluted and spread all over the place, that it should be explicit, abstracted out, and easy to reason about. Um, we also believe that developers should be able to outsource um, this layer of the stack the same way that we're doing with everything from compute to feature flags and authentication, um, and that the, the broader developer community should be able to stand on the shoulders of giants and benefit from uh, the thinking that um, other folks have done before them rather than having to reinvent this at every job they go to. Um, so our view is that the next billion developers are not going to be writing custom if statements sprinkled throughout their code base. They're going to be adjusting a pre-configured authorization system and they're gonna be way more empowered to uh, build great software as a result. Um, the, the system that we've come up with, the high level framing for this problem that we've come up with, we break into three pieces, rules, data, and enforcement. And so in this, in this talk today, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by walking through what each of those things uh, means. Um, so this is like our MVC for authorization, rules, data, and enforcement. I'm gonna show examples of what those things look like in real life. Um, and then I'm gonna show how Oso thinks about solving the problem I'm using something that I'll describe today as strong opinions loosely held, and I'll get into what I mean by that um, in this particular case. So that's the plan for today. All right, rules, data, enforcement. What are each of these pieces? So rules. This is the generic logic inside your application that describes who should be allowed to do what. So if we were building an application, uh, yeah, like a project management application, we might have a rule that says something like, an owner of a project can delete that project. Cool, so that's an example of rules. Then you've got uh, your data. Your data are the inputs to the rules. Um, so in this case, we might say, you know, Graham is an owner of such and such a project. That would be an example piece of authorization data. The last piece uh, we call enforcement. And this is evaluating those first two pieces, the rules and your data together at runtime, and then rendering a decision back to your application um, so for instance, it might be, you know, can Graham delete this project? Okay, those are the three pieces. Um, I'm now going to spend some time going to each of them uh, at the next level of detail. Ah, so uh, by the way, this, um, this piece of this little uh, Ruby snippet um, actually encodes all three pieces. Um, so what you can see here is the rules are saying, you know, you need to be a, an admin in order to create a task. Um, the data would be a user ID and a Boolean as to whether or not they're an admin. Um, and then this last piece here is showing, you know, what to do with that decision. Okay, now I'm going to go into each of them in, in more depth. Okay, so rules. We said this is the logic that defines who should be allowed to do what in your app. I kind of, uh, I told a bit of a fib before. Um, it is true that there is some naming and structure to this, to the problem in authorization. Uh, you may have heard terms like RBAC uh, and ABAC. Maybe another one you've heard is RBAC. Um, what, what we find, however, um, is that in practice, these terms are so broad and coarse that they're really not useful uh, in the way that we want naming to be useful, which is to help us uh, pattern match and come up with repeatable solutions. 
Um, and I'll, I'll give you a, a couple examples that show what I mean. So um, RBAC, which stands for Role-Based Access Control. There's actually a bunch of different kinds of roles that you could have. You could have a role at an organization level, which says whether you're an owner or a member. Uh, you could have a role uh, at a granular file level. Um, so on a Google Doc, you might be a viewer or an editor or a commenter. Um, and then you can have crazy custom roles, um, like what we're seeing here from the uh, Microsoft Azure billing system. And so what you can see from this example alone is that, you know, RBAC as a term is not really enough to describe the problem space. And one of the things that we're doing at OSO is going about the process of actually giving these patterns names. And these are all based on uh, conversations that the team at OSO has had with real engineering teams like you. Um, I, I'm not going to go into all of these now, um, but this is part of you know, our point of view as to what it takes to solve the authorization problem in a way that works for engineering teams. And if you want to read more about this, we recently uh, wrote a blog post called The 10 Types of Authorization. Um, it's near the top of our blog. Um, so what do I mean by strong opinions? What I mean is um, in order for, uh, since most people don't get out of bed every day thinking about authorization, what, what we believe is the right way to solve this problem is to provide um, an opinionated approach for each of these patterns. So to that end, uh, we have as part of OSO Cloud, a rules editor that comes with primitives for the most common authorization patterns that we see. Um, and what you see on the left is this um, interactive workbench. And on the right, it spits out um, code in Polar, which is our declarative, our declarative configuration language for authorization. We also have all these patterns documented um, in our documentation. And so you can go and read more about them there. Let's take one specific example, which comes up really often, and this is resource specific roles. So for instance, imagine you were building a system that uh, like an application where you wanted to um, have files and folders, um, or in this case, we're showing a, a project. Um, you can have roles and permissions on that project specifically. Uh, and this is a really common pattern that we see where anyone, when you, you might start from something pretty uh, coarse and the next level is doing this kind of resource specific roles. So this is a really, really common one. And to that end, we have a, a built-in primitive into Polar, our language, as well as um, our, our developer tooling to, to guide you towards um, how to structure this problem. Cool. So I said strong opinions, but loosely held. And, and what we mean by loosely held is um, authorization is, of course, uh, it needs to serve whatever requirements your application has. And so it's not always going to be the case that every pattern is going to line up one to one with what you need to do. Or maybe there's a specific, very custom thing that you need to represent for your application. And so that's why we have under the hood this declarative configuration language called Polar for expressing anything that you want. Um, and so here's an example of some custom logic that says um, a user has, has the permission to kill a task um, if that task is in a, is in a zombie state, uh, whatever that means. And so that's something that probably wouldn't re be repeatable across different businesses, but is relatively trivial to recreate in Polar. So this is what we mean by strong opinions loosely held in this context. Uh, strong opinions being um, an, sort of an on-rails way for you to get going, uh, but loosely held with the escape hash to do anything custom as you need. And that's the, that's the bit on rules. I'm not going to go on to data. So we said data are the inputs to the rules. And an example in this zombie project management system that we're building would be that, you know, the user uh, Derek... Um, is a is an admin of the org zombie bears. Okay, so that's our piece of data. Now, there's a bunch of different ways that you can model this. Um, you could model this as a column on your user table. You can make a rules table. You could add this as a col column on your org table. There's a bunch of different ways. Um, but uh, I said that we're going to give you some strong opinions. And the reason why you want strong opinions here is because um, it turns out unsurprisingly, like the rest of data modeling, that how you model your data will determine um, how fast the, the response times are. And it turns out there are some pretty common patterns in the types of authorization questions that you need to ask. And so if we do a little thinking about that, we can come up with an opinionated approach. And in OSO, that opinionated approach is called a fact. This is what a fact looks like. This is the, um, the OSO's point of view on the, the best data model for authorization. Um, here's an example fact. 
that it says that a, a user Derek uh, has the role admin on the organization Zombie Bears. And this is like a very typical fact. In fact, um, here you can see um, this broken down uh, again, which is showing the fact name uh, has role and the different arguments that it takes in. Great. Uh, I also said, you know, that this needs to be, uh, you know, our approach is strong opinions loosely held. And so you can see that um, facts can actually tape in, take in more than, um, uh, can actually take in an arbitrary number of arguments. And what that allows us to do is represent a bunch of different types of uh, rules patterns um, that we see, uh, like, like the ones I was just showing you in the prior section. And um, and so where the, where the rubber meets the road on this is you can imagine that you know a, a policy which would be a collection of rules can uh, for a, a meaningful application can can get long because you've got all kinds of different pieces of logic that you need to represent. And the upshot of that is you might actually have a bunch of different ways that someone could have the read permission on, for instance, a project. So maybe they can read if they're a member of the project. They can read if they're an admin of the project, they can read if they're an owner, or maybe there's this you know, special condition where they can read if it's public. Okay, so um, what OSO is going to do with all of this, so these are all pieces of data effectively that could make, uh, could allow someone to have this read permission. Um, so what's an efficient way for us to go and, and find out if any of these is true? What we'll do is we'll take any, any of those, um, those rules conditions and we will turn it into a set of facts that would need to be true in order to satisfy that condition, which on our end, under the hood, we're actually doing using some um, highly optimized SQL queries. And that's kind of it. Um, a little bit of magic, a little bit of, you know, sort of like data modeling best practices. Um, and that's what buys you, uh, that's what buys you the ability to ensure you can support all the authorization use cases that you need to support with this data format while also ensuring that um, the queries return quickly. Um, and as you can see here, um, we've got, uh, we've done benchmarking up to a, a billion facts. I actually think we've gone farther than this recently, um, showing you um, how low latency the response times are um, even on this large data set. That's data. The last piece is enforcement. Okay, so we said enforcement is evaluating the rules and the data together and then rendering a decision back to your application. And so um, in, in our example from the beginning, it was, hey, you know, you, if you're not a user, what do you do? If you're not an admin, excuse me, what do you do? Um, but in any given application, this is actually gonna appear more than once, right? It's not just gonna be in the one place. You're gonna have these if statements all over the place. And I'm showing you three here in all likelihood, there's gonna be way more all throughout your code base. And that can get um, challenging for a bunch of different reasons. Um, so what we what we have is a point of view on, um, on how you should solve this piece of the problem. And the first piece that you should do is you should abstract it behind an API. And the API that we have for this uh, is called authorize, and it takes in three arguments, an actor, an action, and a resource. So for instance, the, the user can read uh, you know, a task, something like that. So we're checking to see if this user can read a specific task. Um, in fact, we know that there are um, a few other types of authorization questions that are really common. Um, and so we have APIs for those too. Um, so um, the OSO actions um, uh, API will return back um, a list of actions that, that a user can take on a specific task. Um, lists, list filtering is also a really common use case. So we have an API for that. Okay, great. What does this do for you? Well, now you have one place where you can look at all your rules. And if you ever need to change any authorization logic, you change it in that one place and it will automatically flow through to all those other places where you previously had that logic hard coded inside your application. So this is you know, relatively standard. This is just the benefit of extracting it behind an API, like what you'd get in a lot of other contexts. Um, but specifically for authorization, there's a number of other benefits that we see here. Um, so now it makes it possible, you have this sort of like single choke point at which you can um, apply these other, uh, what I'll call like you know, development and observability um, tactics that are really useful for building authorization. Um, so one of them is logging, um, showing you uh, who made what authorization requests and when, and whether those things were allowed or denied. And because you're doing this so deeply embedded inside the application, you get a lot of really meaningful insight. Um, you can also do debugging. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is an interface for the OSO debugger called explain, which will show you for a given query, 
why it succeeded or failed. Um, and you can also do tests. And so this is like a test setup block, a uh, test block that we have in a no so rule. Um, and on top of that, we can also do things like um, show you why tests are failing and give you suggestions as to why, uh, how you can fix them. Um, but of course, I said that all these things need to be loosely held. And so um, there are all kinds of authorization questions that you might want to ask. It might not just be, you know, can this user do this thing on this resource or show me all the users who can do this thing on this resource. Um, and so uh, an example, in order to solve for that, we have um, an API called Query. And Query allows you to construct any of these questions um, for your application based on whatever you need. Uh, in this case, what we're doing is a query that's meant to help us um, render a UI where uh, we want to see which repositories um, John can read in, in the org that he's in. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, so it's this custom query that we call allow by organization. And we're checking if the user John, uh, what are the, uh, for user John, who wants to read, what are all the repositories uh, that he, in, in across all organizations that he can see. And so you can see we've included these wildcards. Um, and so this is just one example of how you can use the query API to construct, you know, any authorization question that you might never need. By the way, our, our higher level APIs just wrap the query endpoint. So there we have it. We've got rules, data, and enforcement. These are the three pieces of authorization. We now have names for them. We can come up with opinionated solutions for them. Um, and that's, um, that's, a, that's, what, that's what OSO is doing, thinking about authorization as a system, applying names, and coming up with repeatable solutions. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to our next speaker. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fran. You're very welcome. Uh, hey everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm Sam, the co-founder CTO at Oslo, and what I'm going to be doing now is kind of giving you a live practical demo of some of the stuff that Graham was just uh, kindly talking us through. So as I said, this is an interactive demo. You are willing or unwilling participants in this. Uh, so please, what what I'd love you all to do, please uh, get out your phones or uh, uh, I don't know, if I go to this URL on your laptop. I'm going to do it on my phone so I can both demo and uh you know demo and follow along at the same time i'm gonna go ahead and scan this qr code and i'll visit that url and you should be you know faced with this beautifully designed website with this um you know weird weirdly generated ai bear thing um so yeah so once you're all everyone's able to load that page and get the bear up so just go ahead and click get started uh, to log in, you can either log in as a John, if you just type in a username, or if you just hit sign in straight away, it'll log you in as a random user. And what you should see is this little, um, yeah, the background here really is working for me well. You should see a little list of, of organizations. This is our little example application. All right, so what you're looking at is a little GitHub clone that we built for the sake of showing some authorization. Um, see, this is a demo about authorization, not authentication, because there is no uh, username and password credentials that we care about. Um, but yeah, okay, so what I want you all to try and do, um, if everyone's able to log into this, is just go ahead and try and create a new organization. It should be a nice big blue button at the top. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and do this here so you can see it happening as well. Um, cool, so I'm going to try and create a new organization, um, Sam's new org. Oh no, error, not authorized to create organizations. What is, what is going on? What is going on? Uh, and so let's 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 see how how pe people are faring. Cool. So we can see we've got some, we've got a bunch of logins. We've got some people logging in. We've we've got a bunch of people trying to create organizations and failing. Uh, okay, this is actually also doing its job right here. This is this was expected. Um, basically, inside you know this is you know also here is doing authorization to say like are people allowed to create organizations or not? And we're we're saying no. Um, I can actually jump over to my my logs display. Well, you know, one of the things that Graham was just talking through 
uh, that we get. And I want to go and filter by denied results. And here we go. Here are all the different fake users that we just created trying to go and create organizations. And we're seeing that those results were denied. People are not allowed to create organizations. And so the reason this is, is because of the, the rules, the logic that we've written to say you can do what inside our app and the data. Like those two things didn't say that you can create an organization. Uh, I can see this actually in my, in my policy here. I sneakily commented out this line of code that said everybody can create an organization. So I'm going to uncomment this. This is now say that all users can create organizations. And I'm going to update my code. Right. So just save, my, save that new policy. And in that moment, our logic that says who can do one side of the app has been instantly updated. So you should now be able to go back to our uh, create organizations page. And I'm going to try again. Oops. And instead, I'm getting Postgres errors. That's fun. But uh, hopefully, on the authorization side of things, oh, work for Graham. That's nice. <laughs> nice. Invalid syntax for type inch. <laughs> But a bunch of people apparently have managed to create events. I'm just the one who was unlucky about this. Boom, look at that, eight successes. We have people creating organizations left and right. And so that's basically, you know, that, that is like also in a, in a nutshell, right? We have, we have it as a separate service that's saying who can do what. And when your application goes and tries to do something, so in this case, uh, actually, let me, let me show you a little bit under the hood what's going on. So this is a little architecture that I'm actually running here under the, under the hood. Right, so we've got my our UI, this beautiful UI you were just interacting with. Um, we've got like a little request router that's kind of forwarding requests to these two little microservices. One's a Python Flask app that's handling like the core of Git, uh, Git Club here, and the other one is doing like a GitHub Action style thing. There's no doubt. And those two apps, they're basically using Oso as this like oracle to answer like, can users do things or not? Um, now, Oso there is this, you know, it's this independent service. It allows us to do things like, you know, update our logic independently from our application logic to specify rules and who can do what and, and things like that. Um, and so this is kind of a, a simplistic example that shows, you know, everyone can create organizations, but like similarly, um, you should be able to go in and try and do some more interesting things. Wow, this one's really <laughs> sweet. <laughs> I knew I shouldn't try to update my app. Um, so you can't try and do anything more interesting. Unfortunately, creating organizations is all we can do in here. Um, but for example, if I was to go and make some equivalent requests from my from my command line, right? So also both is a you know an SDK you can integrate with your app as well as a command line utility. Let me try and drag this up. You know, I can ask you know more detailed questions like things like you know is user John allowed to delete organization uh, one, let's say, and I get back you know again a, an authorization result that says is this allowed or not. And once again, I can go back into my into my logs and I can see these things happening, right? John tried to delete organization one, it, it was denied. Um, and this is where I can start trying to figure out like what's going on, going, going on inside my app. Like why can John not delete? Again, like Graham was talking about, I can see, you know, I can look at our debugger and see what are the things that would let John uh, delete an organization. Um, and there's not many things. You'd have to be granted explicit permission or have a, uh, a role that grants it. And looking through my policy, again, I notice I sneakily went and commented out some logic that says users can delete organizations. So let me let me go and add that logic back in. Now you can delete an organization if you're an admin of that organization. And so if I go back and try this again, cool, John can now delete organizations. And not only that, I can go see this in my log was allowed. I can even go and see, you know, hit try this query and see exactly why, you know, so made this decision. Cool. So that's just a you know quick demo of how Sam can't build applications, but can build authorization services. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Jed Gresham. I am head of product at Oso, and I'm going to take you through some polar information, which is our configuration language. I think Graham mentioned earlier that we have a configuration language called polar, and I'm going to take you through some syntax, some testing, and uh, the visual editor we have. So stand by here. Share my screen. All right.
Okay, so what's Polar? Polar is a declarative configuration language that's built for authorization, which is means that we optimize for answering questions like, is this user allowed to do this action on this resource? I'm going this is the icebreaker question. It's the easy one. We're gonna get it out of the way so you know how this is gonna go. Thank you, Francesca. So what isn't polar? What is not polar? Declarative, authorization, ursine, configuration, or amazing? So this is a hard one, I know. Hopefully you're taking notes. What are they saying, Francesca? What does everybody think? Okay, excellent. All right, let's move on. All right, so, oh good. <laughs> Looks like most of us got it right, so great job. Uh, Ursine is the correct answer to that quiz. Uh, that is how we will be doing some of our quiz questions. So uh, there'll be a few more of those. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about let's talk about polar syntax a little bit. We need to get this out of the way because you need to understand a little bit about how polar works. You've seen some things in slides, but I want you to understand it a little bit better. This is a uh, a resource block. So we noticed a bunch of users inventing different ways to express really common rules rules for associating roles and permissions to a resource within their application. So we made this pattern called a resource block to make this a little bit more straightforward for users. It requires a block of code where you define the name of the resource you want to manage. And this could be something that you would find in a table in your application database or something. Then you define roles and permissions as you declare them and then assign permissions to each of the roles. So if we wanted to add a new role called a writer, then we would go into roles and we would declare a new role called writer next to the reader one that we already had. And then we would need to add a new permission for that role to have. So we would go into permissions and next to the read permission, we would create a new permission called write and we would put that there. If you want the writer to also inherit the permissions of the reader role, because that's a very common thing, then you declare that the writer is also a reader and therefore inherits all the reader's permissions. In this case, we're saying that folder resources have a relationship called parent. So this is a thing called a, uh, a relation. And that means that they can both be a parent or have a parent. And this is good for hierarchies, like if a folder with files inside it or a folder with folders inside it. So that allows us to describe how roles inherit permissions um, uh, inside the resource block by using these things called relations. Um, this polar statement says that a reader is able to read a folder within the parent and a writer is able to write to a folder within the parent. We don't have to explicitly mention every child or subfolder in the hierarchy here if we want to grant a user a reader role for each of the folders. We just have to say that if the reader is a reader on the parent, they're a reader on all the folders within the parent. And this allows us to handle some recursion use cases. So here's our next poll question. In this sample code, can writers read? Hmm. What is it saying? What's winning, Francesca? Writers should be able to read in this. So if you said that, that's good. Excellent. All right, let's close that. Now let's talk about facts, which again, Graham mentioned earlier. Facts are a, uh, a, a way for you to represent authorization data and with a kind of a, a simple, simplified data model. A fact is a predicate name that is followed by typed identifiers as arguments you can provide. And as Graham said, that there could be a number of different identifier, uh, different arguments for a fact, depending on what you need it for. 
Um, these arguments are creating a relationship between the resources that are mentioned. In this case, the fact references a user called Alice. And it gives her a reader role on a folder called bears. And uh, you can see how the, the data connects to the, the data connects to the, the user to the permission and the resource that it's attached to. So the next question about facts, which should uh, exercise your knowledge of facts and the policy is can user Claude read the folder bears? So let's see what folks say about that. Hmm. This is a tough one. This puts together many different ideas. I'm answering I don't know to these. That's me, if you see that. All right, cool. Okay, great. The answer is yes. Excellent. Close out of that. Okay, so let's talk about policy testing. Super important for you to, if in, in the process of developing a policy, you need to be verifying and validating that the policy is doing what you think it should do. So there's a way inside your policy to write unit tests. Uh, we allow you to do that right inside the policy. So first, you, you create a block of code and uh, you give your test a name, in this case, owners read organizations. You include facts you, you just learned about, inside the test because you need that for your test. You need test data for, for the, the test to try. The test then looks for conditions that are true by using assert statements. If you're familiar with other unit testing, you've probably seen this pattern before. So we have assert statements and we have assert not statements, which are a false assertion. Um, okay, so that's, that's how you run a test. Uh, you do this for basically any kind of logic that you have in your policy, you can set up tests for. So the next question is about policy tests. Which of these are not elements of a policy test? Set up, assert, or assert not? I think we're missing one because the, <laughs> there should be a fourth thing in here, which should say help really big, like on my slide. Um, so, all of these are actually elements of a policy test. It's a trick question. I hope uh, I hope you you notice that. So we'll move on. We'll close that poll and we'll move on. That was a trick question, folks. All right. I know that programming languages are super cool, and everybody wants to learn yet another language, right? Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe you do. Um, if it's the right tool for solving a meaningful problem you have, you probably do want to learn it. But what if you really don't know yet if it's a thing you need? Enter workbench mode. So we're going to talk about workbench really quick. And for this, it's actually better for me to demo than it is for me to uh, show you pictures. So stand by while I switch over to my other tab here. Boop. Okay, you should be seeing a policy editor inside Oso Cloud with a little bit of a policy written here that is from our starter policy, which we give you to, to begin with that has, has some basic patterns in it. Okay, so to make sure I have the latest version of the edited thing, I'm gonna deploy it, okay. All right, I don't really know anything about polar syntax yet. I'm new. I don't know if I want to learn polar syntax. I want to see what it can do. And I'm going to try to express some of the authorization requirements I have. Um, but I don't really know anything about how to write polar. So I'm actually going to switch over to this thing called workbench mode. Workbench mode is a visual policy editor, uh, creator authoring tool. And okay, so I have I have a simple policy that gives me multi-tenancy, it gives me a resource called project and it gives me some roles and permissions on that resource. I want to add, I have a, I have a super user type account. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that. The way that I would do that would be going into organization and under global roles, actually let's, let's go here, let's go to this plus sign, hit add logic. And there's a few options here. 
And one of the options is uh, some users may have system, some users may have system wide roles that grant access to organization. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hit add on that. I'm gonna hit add go to the global roles. Add global roles. Global roles are a way for us to handle a, a, a user role that might be granted permissions across a number of different resources within your application. So now that I have a global role, I have it on this resource called organization. I actually want to add that to the project resource. So I have this global roles tab down on project. I want to say that anybody who has a global role on my organization should also have uh, a viewer access as a member role on a project. So I have that. I want to deploy that. Okay, so it shows me a diff of the 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 policy before and after. I'll deploy. I'll save that. And then you know I really want to. I want to. I want some tests for this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna automatically create a bunch of unit tests for this thing that I just added, and it will exercise a bunch of different. Uh, a bunch of different patterns and it makes sure that I'm testing across the different, uh, the breadth of the patterns inside that logic. I'm going to deploy this. And you know what's cool is I can switch over to code mode and I can edit that. Let's just say that I, I believe that Alice, um, there's an assert not statement on Alice in, in this test. You know what? I want to, I think that Alice should be able to uh, allow, I, I want Alice to actually be able to do this. So I remove the not and then I run tests. And there's an error. So I'm going to highlight that, hit quick fix, view suggested fixes, and also actually tells me what is wrong with the test and will give me a suggested fix. It could give me a number of suggested fixes, and I can scroll through and decide which one of these I want to use. I like the first one. I like what it's saying. Um, so I'm going to hit accept. It changed the, the code to the, the test code to make the test work. It reruns the test and shows me that the test now works. So that's the one I want. I'm going to hit deploy, save that. And if I wanted to, I could duplicate a resource block if I wanted to do this. So let's just call this resource X. I'm going to remove some of these things that don't make sense here. Remove this. OK, so I have this resource X. Great, I want to save that. I'm going to go back over to workbench mode. And I have resource X here. And if I wanted to quickly create a bunch of tests for this, that I just the the code that I just wrote in my editor, I could hit create test, and now I have a bunch of unit tests for this for this resource block. If I save that, and I go back into code mode, all the new tests are there. So what I want you to take away from this is, if you're new to Polar Polar syntax, and you don't yet know if you want to learn Polar. And you want to test it out and get some powerful authorization patterns into your configuration, Workbench mode is a great way to do that visually without having to learn the polar syntax right away. And it lets you switch back and forth between the visual editor and the actual uh, code editor. So you can play with things, change them, and then switch back over to add some patterns there. So I'm going to switch back over now to my policy puzzle. And I have one last question, or two, two questions. Is, does Workbench allow you to visually author policy, author policies and auto-generate full coverage unit tests? Is that true? You tell me. <laughs> that can't possibly be true. I'm gonna say false on it. That's, that can't possibly be true. It's too good to be true. But you know what? It is true. So if you didn't get it yet, the answer is true. It does allow you to visually author policies and auto-generate unit tests. So good. All right. Last question is, what's a polar policy? So this one, extra credit. Is it rules about white bears, guidelines for drinking bubble water, best practices for cleaning your magnets? Or is it a set of rules describing complex authorization patterns that can be visually built and edited? Well, that's the answer, it's D. So if you didn't know, that's what polar policies are. And that is my time. Thank you very much.
to show us how polar works. Um, I think that fixed it. You Wonderful. Um, it's not a live demo without some audio issues. I'm Jesse. I'm an engineer on the team. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how Oso the service actually works. So not much polar here. Um, before I do that, uh, for a little added peril and drama, um, we're throwing some load at our dev environment. Um, Sam thinks it's funny when the dev environment falls over when I'm giving this demo. Um, so I'm I've been instructed to increase the amount of load. Um, let's uh, do 15. So we've got 15, some 15, previously five, now 15 uh, nodes throwing a uh, load at our dev environment. Um, these are all, you know, this, this is the policy uh, that, you know, those are using and they're all making requests that look something like this. So fairly straightforward, um, looks a lot like what we've kind of been talking about. Um, while we wait for that to queue up, I can, uh, torture you with some more slides. Um, this is a children's drawing of, uh, what a good title could be like the anatomy of a right. Um, I'll talk a little more about what that means, but I it's good to look at here because um, it uh, can help, like you know, under help, help helps me to explain like what all of the like pieces are uh, concisely. So, um, Oso is globally replicated. Um, what does that mean? It means that uh, the data that you know we we have what we call feature nodes, which are the you know, computers that are actually performing authorization requests when we ask whether or not Alice is allowed to read the Anvil's repository. They do that using a combination of policy and data, as has been, you know, discussed previously. Um, we want the policy and the data to be replicated across all of those feature, feature nodes, regardless of where they are, um, you know, geographically. Uh, we want this because we want authorizations to be very fast and we want authorizations to be very fast regardless of where the authorization request is coming from and network is kind of the irreducible speed of light factor uh so globally replicating um the data that is written to oso um, to perform authorizations is kind of a prerequisite for us to be able to say that authorizations will be fast no matter where you are you know making the authorization request from so we use an event sourced architecture for this so when a user makes some kind of request to an application that uh ends up needing to write or modify i, I i'm going to be saying write, but like write could mean insert update delete any kind of like data modification um that uh you know the application will you know tell oso cloud like hey uh, insert a fact please and that gets tossed off to our message we use kafka um if you wanted to implement oso cloud or a service like it any um message broker with like pub sub semantics would do um and then all of the feature nodes are subscribing to you know fact insertion update delete events and uh that gets replicated to the feature nodes that way um so when you make an authorization from you know either this, these are you know the aws regions from either us east one or us west two uh the query you know the polar queries that graham alluded to earlier will happen on any of these nodes and uh with fairly good like you know fairly low like replication lag um they will all be eventually consistent and that you know means that uh, those reads are um, consistent and they get to happen you know locally within a region and don't incur you know the, the network latency of like trying to read from US West one having to go all the way to US East one um, US West two excuse me uh, oh boy here are some numbers uh, this is 
from a while ago, but these are all pretty much uh, still the case. Um, read latency is uh, very, we have an internal uh, SLO of uh, like 20 like milliseconds for um, like list and, uh, you know, query like queries that can return like an arbitrary number of results and can be like arbitrarily complicated. We, our like stretch SLO for um, just regular like point authorization is five milliseconds. Um, write latency, this is like the end to end latency, um, is for, you know, US East one, US East one, which is just the in the previous chart. Uh, you know, the request goes here, goes to the message bus and gets back, um, is 50 in, you know, 50 milliseconds in the worst case, on average, it's significantly lower than that. Um, for that are further away uh, from US East 1, because that's where the message bus is like located, this increases. Um, in general, we try very hard and have found that it is feasible for regions as far away as like AP Southeast um, to have this number be low enough that it is like subhuman perceptible where like a, you know, in your, in, in real application, like Sam's uh, adding a fact uh, will, you know, from a far off region will, you know, incur some latency, but it won't, you know, it, it won't be so great that it is perceptible to the person, you know, viewing the web page. Um, Start of time is not particularly uh, interesting um, for this talk, uh, but we but it's important to us because we want to be able to uh, auto scale um, our feature nodes arbitrarily. Um, some lessons that we have learned uh, in doing this, if you are like interested in globally uh, replicating data via an event sourcing architecture, uh, mirroring the patterns that you are using in production within your testing infrastructure. Uh, this is sort of a no brainer and I feel a little silly saying it, but it is the case that, um, you know, when there is a uh, replication lag across regions, you will want to be able to uh, test that. Um, at least you encounter strange uh, bugs that have to do with time in production. Um, be aware of Kafka internals. You can replace Kafka with, you know, another uh, system if you want, but it is the case that when you draw a, uh, architecture diagram that looks like this, whatever this big purple thing is, even if it's very, you know, good, very reliable, and you don't need to think about how it actually works 99% of the time, there is going to be a 1% of the time where you do need to think a little bit about how it works, and you need to um, kind of dive into the details. Um, so it's important to um, be aware of that and to, you know, make your decision about what said large purple monolith monolithic infrastructure chunk in the center of your architecture diagram is based on the fact that you will need to be aware of its uh, internal you know implementation details at some point and observe everything uh you know this is uh you know the number of uh computers that are represented in this diagram it is important to be able to know what is going on on the various computers at various points in time um, I'll say no more about that because if I need to convince you of why that would be good, I, I don't actually know if I can do anything for you. Um, let's see if we are actually throwing load at the system. So recall, I added some additional load. These are the requests that we are making. This is, um, our internal logging. I'm going to refresh this cool. So. I cranked it up to 15 for a while. I, we were just doing like 3000 requests per minute, which is not that many. Um, we cranked it up a little bit and we were doing 1500. Uh, now we're doing 45,000 and um, the response time is still, this is the um, 99th percentile, uh, still less than four, seconds, which is cool. Um, this is our another, this is Honeycomb. It's another observability tool that we use. Um, so the, this, this late, this latency is measured at our load balancer. Um, this is measured, uh, within the service and this 
also looks pretty good. Um, I wonder if um, I triggered any auto scaling, in which you're going to watch me find that live now, which who knows if I'll be able to. Um, cool. So, no, we are not which is cool. These are not um, particularly big, chunky uh, servers. They're like, I think they have like four cores. Uh, so there's like three, four core um, servers currently uh, serving uh, 46, 45,000 requests per minute, which I can't math uh, live or um, not live that's like uh 750 a second which is pretty good and um yeah that's uh that's my demo um i was told to leave time for a q a testing Perfect. Um, thanks everybody for joining today. That's the end of our talks and demos. Um, the We picked a winner for our um, sweatshirt giveaway and it is Martin, the only Martin. So thank you, Martin, for participating. Um, we'll follow up with you separately to coordinate that, but uh, and thank you all for, for joining and participating. Um, I posted in the chat a link to our Slack community so you connect with us there. Um, and additionally, if you want to continue to have a conversation with any of these uh, OSO engineers, I'm putting a link to a Calendly that allows you to book uh, a one-to-one -one meeting with them if you have questions about authorization, OSO in general. So um, thanks again for joining. We are recording this meeting and we plan to send it out to everybody who registered. Um, otherwise, have a wonderful end of your Tuesday. We'll likely send a note out to everyone with the recording tomorrow.